Genesis chapter 9. An interesting chapter. It's one of those chapters where where you read it right after chapter 8, where there's such a high, where you see the presence of God, his plan unfolding, uh, the victory of the waters receding and falling, and, and then Noah <clears throat> exiting the, the ark, the protection of God there, and, and now creating a whole new race. And you think from that point on, you think, wow, everything is going to be perfect, right? You think everything's going to just fall into place because God chose righteous Noah. And righteous Noah is going to make sure that everything is done just right. How many of us live like that? How many of us try to live like that as Christians? We think that we're going to make everything just right. And we find out that we make it all wrong. We really do. I remember when I first became a Christian. And my life radically changed it was a revival in my own heart um, I did some strange things uh, because I just was changed so deeply and, and moved that I just wanted everything that God had for me and, and I thought to myself this is it um, everything's going to be perfect from this point on my relationship with my wife my children my family my job everything's just going to be perfect I mean I'm, I'm not going to have any more problems I mean I, really, I literally thought this because I thought so highly of, of God and who he was and he was but I thought of myself as just as highly because I was so on fire I was so obedient to him I followed every little commandment of him and made it my purpose and aim uh, to not uh, go to the left or to the right from it but stick forward and people were offended by it because I just would not budge at all and it caused friction but then reality set in when I realized you're still a sinner and you still live in this sinful body and still sin is still alive in your heart and in your desires and I fell I fell and I realized that I needed Jesus even more than ever before don't think that life is perfect we live that way we definitely do your expectations of other people are really unrealistic if you think that they're going to be perfect if they're going to meet your needs you're wrong if you think they're going to do it the way that you want it done and when you want it done and how you want it done, you're wrong. You are totally depending upon people and not God because people will fail you. Noah is going to fail his sons and then his sons will fail Noah. You can't have high expectations. I know that we probably say it quite often, I have high expectations for you. I think you can be better and, and I think you could do better. I think you can achieve these things. And those things may be true, and I think we should always strive to do so. But it's when we fall that we realize that we're sinners and that we are flawed. And in reality, we need to have the expectations of God. And truly, it really is our heart's desire to fulfill His plan and not our own expectations. Because we are children of God and God has a plan for us, for us. Whatever your plans are for yourself right now may not be the plans of God for you. And we have to submit to God's plans more than our own plans. And that's why we fail. We won't fail when we follow God completely, humbly, and gently. So this evening we're going to look at Noadic's covenant. A covenant that, that God makes. And it's important that we understand what covenant is. The first covenant was with Adam. Adam failed, he sinned in the garden. God made a covenant with him. Because you sin in the garden, I will send my seed. And that seed will crush the head of the enemy. That's a covenant and a promise on God's part, not on Adam's part. Adam has nothing to do with the covenant. He can't keep it. He can't keep his promises. And then we come to Noah's covenant here, which we're going to look today. And of course, again, it has nothing to do with Noah. It has to do with God keeping his covenant and promises to Noah. And that's important to understand when we get to Abraham's covenant, David's covenant, and then ultimately, Jesus' covenant. Our relationship with God is based upon the covenant with Jesus Christ. That his death on the cross, his blood that was shed, made a way into heaven if we have faith and believe in that that will be saved that's the covenant that jesus did whose work is it his do we play any part in it no can we keep a promise there somewhere not at all it's all his work when you look at abraham's covenant 
and God makes a covenant with him and there was a custom where you would take an animal and you would divide the animal in half and lay it its blood uh, along the path and lay the animal there and then both would would in a sense hold hands and walk through uh, the animal and uh, as they went through the animal they were both agreeing that we promise to keep this uh, covenant with one another well when God was making this covenant with Abraham he literally put Abraham to sleep he put him to sleep and then God walked through it because he knew Abraham wouldn't keep it says a lot about us, but I think it says more about God. How grateful, how loving, how caring he is for human beings when in reality we don't deserve it. Man has a way of breaking his promises to God, yet God has always kept his promises. I love that. I love that completely. I hold on to that, that even when I sin, I can always come back at the feet of Jesus and say, I'm sorry, and have true repentance and turn from that sin. Because many people say, I'm sorry. You, you know those people. They're always doing something, and they come, oh, I'm sorry. And then they're doing it again, and you go, oh, I'm sorry. And then they just keep doing it. I'm so they're not really sorry. They're sorry that you're catching them. They're sorry that they have to say they're sorry, but they're not willing to stop what they're doing and turn the other way. That's true repentance, turning the other way 180 degrees. We can't keep promises. Only God keeps promises. So God's gonna bless Noah and his family. He made a covenant that he would never again destroy the earth with a flood. And we see that picture almost every time it rains. Uh, we'll see a, a beautiful rainbow across the sky, sometimes a double rainbow across the sky, you know, with all the different colors and so forth. And of course, the enemy will take that beautiful rainbow, the sign of the covenant, that God would never flood the earth again, and they, all, the world always perverts it, right? And so now we see this rainbow being used for, for uh, uh, defense of homosexuality and, and so forth. And it makes total sense that the enemy would do something like that. Take something that is so precious to God that, that he paid for and that he promised he'd do for, for not just Noah and his family and for the animals, but for his descendants too. And then the enemy come in and destroy that whole image uh, to, to diminish its true meaning and power that's there that God keeps his promises. Believe me, God will keep his promises to you and what he has made to you. The Noahic covenant can be seen in three basic components here. We have a, a change in their diet. We'll have a change in, in their discipline. And we also have the declaration of the rainbow. Their diet's going to change. Before this, uh, they were pretty much vegetarians. We don't have any evidence at all whether they ate animals. They got along with animals. Obviously, all the animals went in the ark, lions, scorpions, serpents, you know, all there. They had no problem. It was after <clears throat> the flood. God then changed the whole diet plan, and then they had to have uh, discipline in how they treated animals because animals became fearful of man. So let's go ahead and read verses one through seven. It says, so God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air and on all that moves on the earth and on all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I, sh I have given you all things, even as green herbs, but you shall not eat flesh with its life. It is its blood. Surely for your life blood, I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast, I will require it. And from the hand of every man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And also, or and as for you, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundance in the earth and multiply in it. So immediately we, we see this covenant that God makes with Noah. He starts off by 
blessing Noah. God blessed Noah and his sons, and he definitely blessed him. There's no doubt about that at all, that God would choose them because of their obedience to God, that he preserved their life through the flood, and then he um, allowed them to begin all over again. And so he blessed them, and he blessed them because of the offering that Noah made unto the Lord as he built an altar and he sacrificed unto God, which reveals uh, Noah's heart uh, very deeply. You know, um, I've been teaching the word here now for 21 years. 21 years uh, twice a week and sometimes uh, more than twice a week because of special events, men's breakfasts, uh, you know, so forth. And so that's a lot of teaching the word. That's a lot of knowledge. That's a lot of information going out. And I try to give information that's part of the teaching process, to give you information that will give you insight that hopefully then will cause change, right? See, without the change, information and knowledge and all that doesn't mean anything. Uh, you can be a disciple of Jesus Christ and read through the Bible in six months, but if you're not being obedient to it, if it's not changing you, it's really nothing. You can be reading devotions and books and, and learning about living water and learning about grace and learning about mercies and learning about the temple and it's being built. And so you can learn all that stuff and it's very interesting and you can go and tell everybody about it. But if it hasn't changed you, it doesn't mean nothing. If your life hasn't changed, if your views haven't changed, if the way that you view the world's view, worldview, it should be different. You should now have a Christian worldview. And so your Christian worldview will supersede your earthly view. It will, it will replace it. And the things that you used to think, you will no longer think. Because you'll know through the information, through the knowledge, through the understanding of it, that it's wrong and incorrect. And now I'm supposed to approach God in this manner. And then you apply it to your life. That's what Noah was doing with God. He was applying it to his life while the rest of the world was just doing their thing. Well, they had the knowledge that Noah was building an ark. They had the knowledge that Noah uh, said that God was going to cause it to rain. They had all the knowledge. Whether they believed it or not, it seems not because they didn't do anything about it. And so it really doesn't matter how long you've been sitting there. What matters is, is are you doing anything about it? As I said earlier, you can say sorry all day long but it doesn't mean anything unless there's repentance with it, turning the other way. And what I mean by turning the other way is let's say that you steal and you go to the store and you steal a candy bar and they catch you and you go, oh, I'm sorry, I have a tendency of taking things. I don't think about it and I open up the wrapper and I start chewing it and you caught me, I'm sorry. What's the cost here? I'll pay for it, you know, I'm sorry. Then you come back in the store and you do it again and they catch you again and then you keep doing it. Well, you're not really sorry. Because true sorriness would say, oh, let me put it back and I will never do that again. I'm, as I walk into the store and I go to grab it, no, that's not something I should be doing anymore. That has to change in my life. And now I need to go in the other direction and not do that. So true repentance. And this is Noah and this is walk with Noah and God blessed him. And he basically told Noah, be fruitful and multiply just as he did who? Adam. He told Adam the same thing. Fulfill, you know, just fill the earth, populate it, bring my children on there, teach them about me, guide them, lead them, uh, build temples, build churches, you know, worship me, let me be your God, let me lead you, let me guide you, and, and I will bless you. God loves offspring. He loves our, as the proverb says, a quiver full of children. Um, yesterday, I got the chance to go to... Um, far reaching his ministry and had lunch with them and answered a lot of questions. And one of the things that um, I guess, I'm just trying to understand their culture, get some insight as to uh, how it's going to be over there when I get there. I don't want to offend them. I want to understand them a little bit. And so they're very big on family. Um, a lot of them have uh, more than one wife. And so you can imagine how many kids they have. Some have four, four wives. You know, th three wives. Now, if they're Christian, they're supposed to only have one wife because that's what the Bible teaches. 
So they're big on family, and so uh, I thought, okay, that's good. I've got a big family. You know, I've got my four boys, of course, my wife, my one wife, and four boys, and and then um, I've got nine grandchildren, right? And so they're going to relate to me completely. They're going to understand that. They're going to, this guy's fruitful. He's got a big family, right? You know, and then the fact that, that this big family are believers in Jesus Christ, every one of them. They've confessed Christ, and they're being obedient to walking with him and going to church and serving him, every one of them. Of course, not the baby baby, but they will one day. And so that's the evidence of being fruitful and multiplying and glorifying God through your family. And that's what Adam was supposed to do. They're starting over here, a new opportunity, new land. It's chaotic because you can imagine what the flood destroyed. There's pretty much no vegetation. If, if you can imagine just sand on top of weeds and trees and just various things like that, you know, dead animals and all over the place. And they had to go in there and repopulate the whole earth by the command of God, as he told them in Genesis 1, 28 also. So it's a great opportunity for them to start all over. And you would think, okay, well, we are like our forefather, Adam and Eve, but we've got our three sons and their wives, and now we can start off right. And let's do this right. But God then begins to instruct them that the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the air and on all that moves on the earth and all the fish of the sea are given into your hands. Now you'll notice in that, in that and it, it doesn't say that they'll rule over them. They'll have dominion like in Genesis. It doesn't say that anymore. Now the animals will fear man. It seems like at times there are certain animals that we fear, like lions and bears, right? We fear them, but in reality, they fear us when you really think about it. And the reason they attack us is out of fear because they feel threatened. They feel, you, you probably heard the, the phrase, you know, like a dog backed into a corner, right? What's it gonna do? It's gonna bite you because you're backing it into a corner. You're giving it no choice, and so it will bite. And in this case, the serpent will now begin to fear, and if you get close enough and it fears, it's going to strike you. If you get close enough to the lion, it will bite you. If you get close enough to a hippopotamus, it will take care of you. Um, I ha I'll have an opportunity when I go to Sudan to get in a boat with, in, with hippos. I know, I'm thinking about that one. Um, and the gal that uh, told me about that, that they can take me out there, said that they get really scared when they get too close to them and all the natives will kind of just back up on the boat. I'm like, well, what are they doing out there then? Well, they just love these huge hippos. So, so it's not like Disneyland hippos where they just come up with bubbles and no, these are really hippos out in the water. They'll bite you, you know. Now they're vegetarians. They'll just, you know, push you over and probably just crush you and so forth. But it's out of fear and they no longer will rule. So there's been a change. That relationship uh, that God had first created is now stopped because of sin. Every moving thing, verse three, lives, lives shall be food for you. I've given you all things, even the green herbs. So they now will be able to eat the flesh of animals at this point, no longer vegetarians. We don't know if they ate meat before. We do know they sacrificed animals for coverings. Genesis tells us that God sacrificed an animal for their covering and so forth. But whether they ate the animals, we don't know. Obviously, Noah was able to get an animal, a clean animal, and offer up it as a sacrifice on the altar that he built. But whether they ate them or not, it doesn't say. And here it seems that this is the beginning of them eating these animals. But... It's important that when you eat animals, verse 4, that you do not eat the flesh with its life. That is its blood. Now, there's a purpose for this. God wanted to make sure that, that Noah understood the importance of blood, that within the body of a human or an animal is blood, and blood is their life. That's what sustains them. That's what gives them life itself and so we saw the first part of that covenant of being the dietary moving to to um to meat uh able to eat and consume meat to the second which having discipline that when you're eating that meat you don't do anything crazy if you can imagine um 
for the first time you're, you're eating an animal, what do you do? How do you uh, prepare them? You know, so you can almost imagine, you know, do we, do we um, you know, gut them? What do we do here? And so the, there possibly could have been, and there was, and when you see some of the pagan practices, they would literally cut the animal, drink the blood, um, tear the limbs apart, you know, and those type of various things. And that's something that God did not want them to do in, in this whole process. He wanted them to have respect for the blood. Now, Why? because of the blood of Jesus Christ, because it's his blood that was shed for us. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so Jesus shed his blood on our behalf. And so here we see that they're to have that respect. Surely for your lifeblood will be uh, demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast. I will require it. And from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of, of that man. There are some other references on how to eat. Deuteronomy 20, uh, fourteen twenty one: you shall not eat anything that dies of itself. Uh, you may give it to the alien who is within your gates that he may eat it or you may sell it to a foreigner. You shall, it, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. So a uh, couple of things here this respect and honor for the life in the blood is for his, for his people, Israel. Uh, give it to the other people. Um, don't boil them, again, with the blood because you're disrespecting the blood. There are also many who suggest that there are some sanitary reasons for doing that too, that you can get very sick uh, because they didn't know how to process it and so forth and preserve and the things like that. So God was basically protecting them too also. Uh, later, he spells out in Deuteronomy 12, 23, be sure that you do not eat the blood because the blood is the life and you must not eat the life with the meat. So, <clears throat> so whoever sheds man's blood, man or by man his blood shall be shed for in the image of God he made man. So, Verses five and six, uh, you can kind of get a, if you like, an argument for capital punishment. Romans 13 is, is very clear that God has given us uh, ministers, uh, and that is the law, to protect us uh, from those that would harm us as, as people. And so um, he's protecting them here also not to shed man's blood. And then verse seven, the the commandment to be fruitful and multiply now in verses 8 through 17 we see God's covenant of which the rainbow <clears throat> constitutes that pledge verse 8 then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him saying and as for me behold I establish my covenant with you and that's important uh, highlight it's I who is establishing this covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you the birds the cattle every beast of the earth with you of all that go out. This is a covenant of grace, a covenant that God gives not just to Noah, but also to his descendants and to the animal, basically to the earth. And he, he says it in, in several different uh, the ways here that we'll see. Look at verse 11. Thus, I establish my covenant with you. And never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And then notice the earth. And by the way, just a side note, if it was a local flood, then God would be lying because you know, the covenant of the rainbow is never to flood again. So there would never be any local floods, right? Does that make sense? Right? I mean, if, if it was a local flood and God says, I'll never do, give a local flood again, here's the covenant of a rainbow. No, it's a global flood. I'll never do that again. So very clear. I mean, there's this logical sense there. And God said, verse 12, this is a sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. So for every generation, I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be, a, be for a sign, the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth 
that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the, flood, in the cloud and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh of the earth. And so that's a global global covenant with the whole earth. Uh, you can go to John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave, him giving this covenant. He gave what? His son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now there is a truth right there that you cannot deny. Everlasting life comes through the Son of God. And it's by having faith and belief in Him. And that's it. If you have not faith only and trust in what Jesus did on the cross, then you're one of the guys or gals in there that will go the other direction because you're not trusting in God. If your parents, if your grandparents, if your parent who's passed away and your great-grandpa who's passed away, if they were just good people and you loved them because they were good people, but if they never confess Christ as their Savior, you're not going to see them again. That's what that scripture teaches. I don't know how many times I hear people say that. We'll see you again in heaven. You know, unless they have confessed Christ and believe in their heart that he's the only way, you won't see them again in heaven. Understand that true principle. It's a hard one to understand, especially for those that are our are, are loved ones. You know, my dad passed away, and, and I've shared the story before. <clears throat> I tried witnessing to him, and he did not want to receive it. He had his own thought of who Jesus was, and he believed in him his own way. And it was kind of a, a little mishmash of things along with Catholicism, but it wasn't the right way. He was an alcoholic, and he died an alcoholic. He died of a heart attack because of alcoholism. He died on his way to uh, the hospital. He died without Christ. So I will not see him when he gets to heaven. And that took me a long time to admit that and to receive it. But God is just. The God that I serve is righteous. And he makes righteous judgments. And his ways are always the right ways. And I totally put my faith and trust in him even in the salvation of my own father. Now, is there the possibility, and my sisters will, will argue with me and say, no, he's in heaven. Because they'll say, you don't know if all of a sudden he cried out to Jesus at the last minute. You're right, I don't know. I just wonder what Jesus he would be crying out to. Would it be the Jesus that he had in his mind and he thought was a Jesus that he made up? You know, that's the question. Well, I'll know when we get to heaven. If I get there and he's there, I will be totally surprised, but I will rejoice. I will rejoice greatly that he's there. And if he isn't there, then I will totally understand and respect God as who he is, just in all his decision making. But we have to understand the truth. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Have everlasting life. And so it's Jesus Christ that we need. The third element is this declaration, establishing this covenant with every, every, not just man, not just his descendants, not just the beast, but the whole earth, as he said. Now we come to, to verse 18 through 19, where we see Noah's family restocking, restocking the world. You know, it's interesting because we, we just finished Matthew uh, chapter 10, right, on Sunday, and we ended with this... Um, command from Jesus to respect the disciples and, and when you honor them and respect them support them um, esteem them is another word for honor and respect you know uh, children are to respect their their parents no matter what the age is you are to respect your parents and that means the, those little sly looks you know that little <clears throat> whatever you know, all, is, is totally disrespectful when you think your parent is dumb or stupid or don't know what they're doing, totally disrespectful. 
They might not see it in you, but it's disrespectful because you're not honoring them. We're to honor the disciples. We're to honor a prophet. We're to honor those who are sent by the Lord. And when you do that, you know, the, the promise for honoring father and mother, there's a, there's a promise with that too, right? You live long. And with that promise of respecting and honoring those in leadership is that you receive rewards also uh, because you're honoring them. And so Jesus is trying to create a church there that functions and works together. Just like with the, bo- with, with the, with the uh, family unit, how it functions together. And so you have Noah and you have his three sons. And three sons are supposed to respect their father and honor their father. He's the head. He's the patriarch. The covenant was not made with the three sons. The covenant was made with Noah. In my family, the covenant was made with me, not with my three sons. Now, the covenant then will be made with my three sons and their family. But that's how the Lord works. Now, we know that in children and in all human children including myself as a child of my father and my mother is rebelliousness it's just bound up in us and so for us to think that our family is going to be perfect that somehow we're going to measure up you know uh, i think that it's wishful thinking what we need to do is live humbly i like the way that man that last man approached it you notice how he had his pack and he just kind of went like this you know he's just humble you could see the humble bowing his head like i don't deserve to even go in but here You know, I'm just trusting in Jesus. That's humility. Uh, Walking in humility. Proverbs says a lot about children. Proverbs 20, verse 11 says, even a child is known by his deeds. You you know, you can know someone by their deeds. That is what they do, right? Their actions. How they treat their children, how they treat their wife. Uh, The things that they support or don't support. You know a person by their deeds. J. Vernon McGee would always say that um, you, you, wanna sh- you want to see my faith? Look at my checkbook. If I look at your checkbook and there's nothing in there giving to God, what does that say about your faith? That's what he's saying here. A child is known by its deeds. Okay, Whether what he does is pure or right. It's very clear. And so you can see children and their deeds. You can see which children are giving children, which children protect other children, which children love one another, which children are rebellious. You can see it in it. It's it's so interesting. I've seen it in my boys. I see it in my grandchildren. You know, uh, you see it with other kids. And and you just try to mold and shape them as best you can. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And that's the responsibility of the parent, right? Is to train that child up. Not the church, by the way. You know, the public system has your kids for 18 years of their life. Well, minus five, 13 years of their life. And they are indoctrinating them. And you think taking them to church and they color a picture of Noah and the ark is going to somehow equip them to battle that you're wrong it's your responsibility to train those kids and and the reason that your kids are who they are today is because of you whether it was being faithful to train them up in the way of the lord or whether it was letting them go and doing their own thing that's what the world would say no don't tell your kids about religion let them choose even at a young age let them choose let them find their own way that's garbage Uh, the reason that philosophy is given is because they know that ultimately left to themselves they'll destroy themselves they need good moral backgrounds they, they need to understand right from wrong even secular people understand that if you don't teach your children lying and stealing is wrong then they'll end up lying and stealing so we are to train them and, and i take that seriously i took it seriously with my boys i made sure that they understood who jesus was I made sure when they weren't paying attention that I would focus on them to make sure they were paying attention because I wanted to make sure that they got it from me. Now, I love my grandchildren and I try to as much as I can, but that's not my responsibility to train them. It's theirs. But I do train them and I try to lead them 
and give them good counsel, as I know Virginia does the same thing. But ultimately, their growth will be based upon their parents. Proverbs twenty two fifteen: foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. That's plain truth. Uh, it's, just, it, it's just there because we're by nature sinful and, and children left to themselves will be foolish children. You ever watch a, a young little boy? Uh, we were picking up Angelina and there was a boy, he jumps out of his car and so I was just telling Gabby and Ethan, we're like, look at that little boy, just watch, just watch him. And you see him just start running around. You know, they got so much energy, they can't sit still. He starts running up and down, up and down, and like, you go, he's going to climb the tree. No, he doesn't climb the tree. He climbs the stairs, goes up there, and like, watch, watch. He f- picks up something off the ground, it's a stick. He's, he starts hitting the gate, and he picks up a rock, and he starts putting, the, like, watch how all of a sudden he's just doing all these weird things just to burn energy. You know, and it, he almost looks like a clown out there doing all these things. Like, what, are you, what is he doing? He just can't stop from moving. And I turned to Ethan. Ethan was like that. He just couldn't stop from moving all the time, you know. Now he's calming down. He's going to be a sophomore soon. It's hard to believe. The Bible says, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. And it says, the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Boy, that's something... I don't want to touch right now because I could get in big trouble for saying that you should spank your child. You know, that, that, that was going on, I would say, 10, 10 to 15 years ago where, where they were really, really warning churches not to talk about that and so forth. I still talked about it because it's God's word. Uh, there's something about disciplining your children with a swat in the right way at the right time. Personally, I don't like using my hand. I didn't use my hand. I'd use a belt so that it was an object and it wasn't my hand because my dad would use his hand. And it became personal. And there were times where he'd walk by me, he'd raise his hand to do something else, and I went like this. I didn't know if he was going to hit me or what. And so I, don't, I didn't like using hands. I used a belt. And I used the belt quite often. You know, and more often on some than the others. <laughs> depending on the foolishness that was bound up in their heart. <laughs> but it, it is a biblical principle that we should have applied. Proverbs 23, 24, the father of the righteous will greatly rejoice when he who begets a wise child will delight in him. I totally like that one and I get it because I rejoice. And I know you rejoice at your children as they're walking with the Lord, as they're serving the Lord. <clears throat> there are nights where sometimes I think about one of my sons and I start crying. Just the other night, I just started crying and praying for him. Just rejoicing that he's saved. He loves God. And it was just such a neat, emotional time for me just connecting to God and what God was doing it was just such a a neat sensation to have when you see that in your children rod rebukes the rod and rebuke gives wisdom but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother now we come to Noah's family and we think well everything's going to be fine and it says in verse 18 Noah's sons who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. Now notice the order. I, I, I don't believe that the order necessarily gives us their age. Uh, the Bible's clear as, as Ham being the youngest. So I don't think we can use the order for age. Uh, some of the commentaries did. They said Shem was the oldest, Ham was in the middle, and Jephthah was the youngest. But in saying that, you, you contradict what the scripture says. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. So Noah had three sons. They had survived the flood with their wives along with Noah's wife. Ham, the second one mentioned, is the younger. You can see that in verse 24, very clear, is the patriarch of the people of Canaan. Ham is the father of the Canaanites. He is mentioned in more details because of his sin in verse 22. Verse 24 through 25. 
Like Adam, they were to populate the earth. So let's look at the sin. And Noah began, verse 20, Noah began to be a farmer and he planted vineyard. Then he drank of the wine that, and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Jephthah took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders and went backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. Now this is interesting, an interesting little story here. If you were related today, you know, you go to the gym with your children and you're getting dressed and you're naked in front of each other in the gym. So there would be a lot of sinning and problems there. And some take that to an extreme and, and, and cover their nakedness there. We have Noah, who was a farmer, obviously before he became a, a, a boat builder. Now going back to farming, he plants a vineyard. Whether he knew that, that wine was intoxicated or not, it doesn't say. Was it before? We don't know. But some suggest that it was something new and that's why he got drunk. Never mentions him being drunk before because of sin and so forth. Maybe the change of the world, the, the, the whole different uh, dynamics of it because of the flood and so forth. Now, now the vine gives great intoxicating drinks and he drank too much and he got drunk in his own tent. Nothing wrong with that picture, it seems. Of course, the Bible does say, do not get drunk with wine. And by the way, just a side note, we discussed this at one of our pastors meeting. You got about 15 senior pastors talking about drinking and it's amazing how many different uh, views you have and I wanted to bring this up but do you know that according to the state of California and the laws that it's what point is it point oh eight you're legally drunk do you know how much that is that's just one and a half shot that's it and you're legally drunk so if we go by that one can of beer and a half, you're drunk. You've sinned against the Bible. So to say that I can have a beer, uh, you're close. And it's also depending on body size too and weight and so forth. So be careful because it's being drunk. Yeah, you, know, you have the liberty of, of having a cup of wine as long as you're, again, uh, the other aspect of is offending someone else. Someone may see you. You're in a bar. You're in a restaurant. You're drinking wine. I love it. You post your Facebook posts and your wine glasses are all right there for everyone to see that you have the liberty to drink wine. You know, wonderful. And so then the guy at home says that they're drinking. Honey, let's start drinking. And then they get drunk. That's on you. you know, and then your children are watching you too. He's drunk. He's naked. Some suggest that his wife is with him, possibly drunk. We don't know. It doesn't say. And so it could be that when Ham walked in, he actually saw the nakedness of his mother. And then he went and told his brothers, they're naked. What he said and all that, did he boast about it? Did he say, you should see them, you know, whatever. And they just slapped him in the face. You dis disrespectful son, you should not have done that. They get a, a, a covering, they cover and they walk backwards to cover the nakedness of their father. And that's why I think the mother possibly was not there. Some suggest that he may have had relations with his mother. They're to populate the earth. Um, look at Adam and Eve. How did they populate the earth? They began to have relationships with brothers and sisters and so forth. But then God also said a man and a woman too. So, but it doesn't say. Some, some even go way as far in saying that he had homosexual tendencies. It doesn't say. So we really don't know. All we know is that him seeing the nakedness of his father was sin to him. It wasn't sin to Noah because Noah does not get punished for it. Ham does not get punished for it, by the way. His children from Canaan get punished for it, which is interesting. And so, it's an interesting story. Uh, I think that we can gain some principles by it, by first not drinking and not putting ourselves in that position and place. And then as children, not disrespecting your parents. 
you know, why would you uncover the nakedness of a parent and then go tell others? Why would you go tell the secrets of your parents? Why would you go and badmouth them to other people? You know, you keep that between your family. They're your family. And you love them and you respect them and you let God do the work in them. <coughs> so Ham, Ham, the father of the Canaanites, was cursed because of it. A bunch of scriptures that I like to share, but I don't think I'm going to. So verse 24, so Noah woke from his wine, knew what his younger son had done to him, and he said, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brother. So interesting, the youngest, Ham, gets cursed by the father. Now, interesting thought here, at these times it seemed that the father could give curses and blessings, right? You remember with uh, Jacob and Esau, you know, and so forth, Abraham, they could give the blessing or a curse or not bless. And so Jacob uh, was blessed because he covered himself like his brother with uh, Isaac and presented himself before Isaac and Isaac then blessed Jacob and the blessing stuck. So we here have Noah bless or cursing Ham's children. And so he had that authority to do so. And so he cursed the descendants of Canaan. And by the way, uh, through the Canaanites, uh, they were a wicked people. They were an adulterous people, a fornicating people. And it makes sense that God would, would curse them and they would become slaves. In fact, the children of Israel will go into the land of Canaan and destroy as many of them as possible uh, because of this sin. Uh, some have suggested that it was Ham that was cursed, and so his descendants were cursed, and his descendants ha ha could be traced all the way to Africa. And so some suggest that that's why the Africans, dark-skinned people, are cursed and are in slavery. Not true. God cursed Canaan that group of people, that tribe, and not the other sons of Ham. So be careful that you don't spread that around. It was specifically for the people of Canaan. And then Shem, verse 26, he said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. So, so on top of the curse, they were to serve Shem. Now Shem, personal name meaning name, he is Semitic in that the Jewish people come from him. Thus, you have the line of Jesus Christ to Abraham, to David, and then to Jesus. Uh, the name means blessed of Jehovah, my God. It be Shem. And so we'll see more of Shem and his descendants through uh, David and the way, all the way to Christ himself. And then may God enlarge Jephthah, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, May Canaanite be his servants. Now notice it says here that may God enlarge Jephthah. It's not specifically to his children, but to him. But because it's to him, it goes to his children. And his children's children's children go all the way to Europe, which then comes here because we're originally from Europe itself. And so there's a, there's a truth there that God has blessed his ancestors because they were respectful towards their, their parents. Talk about living long, right? Honor your father and mother and you shall live long. And so Shem and Jephthah lived long while Canaan died because you don't see the Canaanites to this day. In verse 28, Noah lived after the flood 350 years. It's a long time to live. So all the days of Noah were 900 and 50 years, and he died. Whew. 950 years. A lot to see. I don't know how he viewed things because it really doesn't say, but you can almost understand the highs and lows of, of life. Living in such a, a wicked, wicked world, to see the world so corrupt, so deceived, uh, you see the, the lying, the mockery, the, the ridicule, the political uh, mumble jumble, you know, that's said and, and, and I'm the savior and, and I'm going to make things right and things are going to be better, you know, and, and I'm a Christian, you know, and then is uh, just all this, this stuff that goes on in the world today. 
And then you get to see God's hand working. You see him alive. You see him working in the midst of all this chaotic, uh, sinful world. And it gives you hope. It gives you hope. And yet you still go through things because we're sinners and we fall short of the glory of God. And so our families and our relationships sometimes are challenged and beaten upon. But we still have that hope. We still have that hope. And I think Noah had that hope. Uh, the hope that, um, that God was going to send his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross. The hope of what the sacrifice, that offering, really meant to him as he gave it unto the Lord. As it spoke of his Savior Jesus Christ. Because in Hebrews 11 it says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. He became the heir of righteousness which is according to faith. That means he believed in what Jesus Christ was going to do in the future, and that was according, that was given to him as righteousness. And Noah had that faith in God. He believed in God in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. We need to believe and trust in God. We need to know that our God is on the throne. Our God is King of kings and Lord of lords. Our God is able to do more abundantly than we can ever think or imagine that is our God. He is our God and he is for us. He's not against us and he'll never leave us or forsake us. And if we walk with him and we trust in the work of Jesus Christ and humbly serve him, then he will always be there for us and we can have hope even while the world is dying around us.